Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Kapasi. It's uh, indeed a pleasure uh, for you to be part of our um, Gujarati Yatra project. The date today is uh, 9th of, uh, 8th of April 2017. If I may start with your early life, uh, just introduce yourself and tell us where and when were you born. Sure. Thank you very much, Dalai, for giving me the opportunity to, to speak and also to represent uh, the, uh, the, the, the British uh, Gujarati community and the Muslim community at the same time as well. Uh, my name is uh, Jafar Kapasi. Uh, I was born in a small village called Masindi, uh, northwest of Uganda. And um, uh, that's, that's a very remote village where we didn't have electricity till 1963. And uh, we didn't have any traffic lamps uh, in, in, in the village. There's only sort of one one street, and um, uh, there was only one hospital, which was a, a bit far away. But uh, in terms of, uh, I didn't have the dentist or any of the facilities there either. And and uh, the roads were all Moram roads, and not built in, you know, tarmac roads. We didn't have those uh, in, in those days. Tell me a bit about your ancestors, because um, you said your, 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 your village was very remote in, in the corner of um, Uganda. How did your parents or your grandparents uh, go all the way to Uganda in this kind of inner um, land? So my, my father was born in a very small village called Jinjura, which is in Katiawa. And uh, the family, uh, they were all in business. In fact, my grandfather, he used to manufacture uh, cooking oil uh, from uh, sesame seeds uh, in a small village, which he used to use ox uh, to, to, to do that. And they had a family business as well, which is near, near another town called Saur Kunla. But the, the, they had the problem in terms of the business was in the decline. So my grandfather decided to send my father, who was only about 14 years old, to travel to East Africa to see you know, whether you know, he could build a future there. The only connection we had uh, in East Africa was my grandfather's cousin was uh, based in Mombasa, and they were called the uh, Dumiwala family. They were very well-established business people in Mombasa, and they employed lots of people there. So my father, he was sent to uh, Mombasa actually initially to work for my my grandfather's cousin, so his great uncle, to work with him. Um, so he, they, uh, they used to go in a ship called SS Karanja, which used to take them 14 days <laughs> to reach Mombasa. So when, when he landed in Mombasa, he was uh, welcomed by uh, the son of um, my his uh, granddad's uh, cousin. So uh, he he went to well, in fact he started working in the shop there. I was saying his station him out. And after a few, a few months, there was another cousin of another cousin. He came from Kampala to say, look, I would, I would like to take this boy with me to Kampala work for me in my business in, in Kampala because again it's the same Dugawala family and they had quite a few branches and, and, and obviously and, but in Kampala they had a wholesale retail business so I would like to take him to Kampala and work for me I said because I'm very short of staff so I said okay I'll so take him so my father used to work for um, this Dugu, other Dugawala family in Kampala he worked for a few months because he wanted to learn the language the lingua franca and, and the culture, the tradition of the, these customers and what they do. So he, he was being trained with all these aspects to do retailing, wholesaling as well, you know, in this business because they're all relatives. And then another uncle came from Sydney to uh, Kampala and he to buy some uh, to the business shopping and he saw my father and then he said, look, I'd like to take this boy to Sydney. And, and this, this uncle said, no, no, please, you know, let him because I need him. He's, he's a hard worker. So no, he said, no, no I, I, I'm short of staff and I, I want him in Masindi. So that's how he ended up in Masindi. And he used to work, um, because the, the, he was a distant relative, but you know, they would provide him accommodation. They would live with as a family member. 
And I remember you saying, you was telling me he was paying about five pounds a year right, in, in today's sort of uh, currency. Uh, but he would get uh, free housing, free food, and he lived with the family, learned the business technique and so on. So he worked for, for this uh, family in Masindi for about, about two years. And then they encouraged him to set up his own business, which is in a very remote village called Bugungu on the shores of Lake Albert. Obviously, you see, in those days, you know, they were traveling bicycles. They didn't have any vehicles to travel. Plus, you know, they would, uh, they would have a cycle track going to the small villages. They would carry uh, goods to sell. They would have African uh, servants with them who would also carry goods with them, take the goods and sell them in a place called Bugungu. And Bugungu had literally nothing there. There's only a few shops there. There were the fish, fishermen there, the African fishermen. They would... Uh, buy you know clothing and anything from something to eat as well you know some beans or whatever you can sell and you would have established a shop where they would sell anything from uh, crockery cutlery food you know uh, atta chapati atta whatever to clothing there were the fabrics there to sell so that's how you know they um, sort of established and also ran the business but they had a very relaxed lifestyle. You know, in the evening, uh, four or five people would get together and talk about India, maybe, or Gujarat, you know, what's happening, see if they can. They were heard on the radio, or the All India Radio, because they would listen to All India Radio in those days, and they would listen to it. And then they would discuss things, you know, what was going on in India, or even in Gujarat, and so on. Uh, so that, that was the link they only had. Yeah, I'm talking about now 1935, 40, uh, before the... Uh, the Second World War. But, you know, they were quite abreast in terms of the links with India. They were very strong uh, Indian links. Uh, and also they would spoke Gujarati. Uh, also they would say their prayers. In fact, they would say their prayers in um, uh, Gujarati books. They, in, in those days, uh, we didn't have the facility of reading it from Arabic. So, there's a lot of very strong Gujarati connection there. And then my father was established, very well established in Bugunga, so he set up a branch in a place called Butiaba, which is on the, again, the shores of Lake Albert, where the good thing about Butiaba was that it was a very flourishing town, and they had a ship there, a ship called Robert Corindon, which the British had built, that built the ship in 1948 in Scotland. And uh, so that ship used to travel, carry cotton, and other goods to Congo in those days, uh, and you know they would try, they would use that as a cargo ship. But the ship also you would carry passengers, and um, this ship called Robert Corrington was named after one of the governors or uh, the British governors who I think was stationed in North Africa, I think somewhere West Africa, and um, you know they had luxurious ship. Uh, built in Scotland in 1948, which was assembled on Lake Albert. You know, they would have a theatre, they would have a dining area, they would have everything there. And they would have all the English people who would run the ship, especially you know, all the key staff, but the junior staff were held by the Africans and so on. So my, my father, the reason I'm mentioning it, my father has connection with this British people who were resident in Butiaba, and they would play even though my father spoke very little English, you know, they would play anything from some of the games, the British games, or uh, tennis, or maybe badminton, and all that, and he used to tell me about that as well. But he maintained a strong connection with, with the, British, the British people in uh, Butiab, who were working uh, with the East African Railway, because that ship was part of the East African Railways and Harbours. Uh, and others I'm mentioning is because eventually my father bought that ship, uh, Robert Corinthian, when they decided not to proceed um, to, in terms of running it from uh, Butiaba to Congo. And in fact, in our home, we have got a, a clock which was part of the ship. Uh, it, it mentions on the clock, it's still running, it's, it's a brass cl uh, ship clock. <laughs> and I think I may have a picture somewhere of that uh, uh, clock. It's, it's a KU, uh, Kenya, Uganda Railways. And um, 
So he had a very relaxed lifestyle compared to what we have here in, in, in this country. So he established the, the second shop in Butiaba and then uh, he went to get married to uh, India in 1948. Uh, I got married in, uh, in Mumbai, where my mother is born in Mumbai. And then came back and obviously we were born, my, my elder brother and myself. And the next question was schools. There are no schools <laughs> in, in Butiawa. So what do we do? So he uh, then decided to move to Masindi where they had some school, a, a few schools. And a few Indian people have settled there, especially from Gujarat. And they had this school called Masindi Public School, which was a private school. He says, okay, let's move to Masindi. But he, he asked, in fact, he employed someone to run his shop in Butiaba. So uh, he, he already got two shops, one in Bugungu, one in Butiaba, and now the third one in Masindi. Again, he, he was able to get a shop there, and uh, housing was a problem. Uh, he couldn't find a good house. Uh, but somehow he bought uh, another big building, which if I got some photographs, for which I can show you, and uh, started trading again in all aspects. You could sell anything from grocery to uh, clothing to fishnets to, and then he also expanded to selling Vespa scooters and bicycles. And so you'd come to a shop and probably see <laughs> everything you want to buy. And he was, he was a very good salesperson. He, his business really expanded, and then into hard, and then eventually he moved into hardware and DIY stuff which was really a big business you know, for him. Uh, he really expanded. And he used to do his shop, shopping in Mombasa or Kampala. All he used to do was to make a phone call and he would get all his goods which he would sell. So, and then he had to send us to school and we got this Masini public school and I've got photographs there. We have been there in, 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 in fact in 1992, uh, the, the, the Sun newspapers who took me then Mr. Graham Deadman who took me back to Kampala to see what had happened on Masini, what had happened to our properties there. So it was a good school. It was majority of the teachers were from Gujarat, uh, Maganbai Patel. I remember and there was Mr. Trivedi and all those days used to teach us and we used to be in scouts and you know, we used to do the parades as well uh, and uh, learn everything about all aspects of life. But everything was done in Gujarati. English came after. And uh, I, must, I must mention some of the good, well, some of the good points about Masini Public School that we, uh, even though it was a it was a private school, there were very few Africans uh, because everything was done in Gujarat, taught in Gujarat, so there were very few Africans who were able to join in. But then came the Independence Day, 1962, 9th of October. So the whole thing's changed and we had to learn everything in English first and Gujarati later. Well, in fact, after English there was Swahili and then Gujarati. Uh, but I, I remember this little incident which uh, I must mention is uh, on the Independence Day and in the Uhuru Parade, the big Uhuru Park, so we, we all paraded, we all was in the Boy Scout and so on. So we went on the Independence Day celebration and the, the, the flag raising ceremony. So we just uh, the town clerk, you know, he um, was able to get the British flag down, and he had to uh, install the Ugandan flag, and he could not do it, you know. Unfortunately, you know, there were some British tourists there because the tourists used to go to Murchison Falls, and they were watching all this you know, from a distance, and they realized that the town clerk was not able to raise the Ugandan flag so they came to the rescue to <laughs> raise the, the Ugandan flag uh, to hoist it so to hoist the Ugandan flag so these are some of the sort of humorous aspects of life uh, it was, it's a very easy going life and we have so much time to kill uh, some of the things which Sorry. Can I just, uh, you, you mentioned uh, about these iconic Dukawalas and yes. um, what did the women folk do at that time? Because your yes. parents, your dad was busy running a shop and what, yes. tell you, give us a little bit of understanding so, of what the women did in those days. I think that's a very good question you're asking. To be honest, you know, women were the backbone of the business. And I'll tell you from my father's experience, 
my mother, even though uh, we had servants at home <coughs> who would help her cook and clean and all that, uh, she would actually participate in the business. <coughs> and not my mother, my mother, there were the Indian, uh, the, the, particularly there were the Gujaratis there, so they, they participated in and helping the business or, or, the, or the husband's business. Because they knew that there was a struggle there in terms of you know, being very few of us there running a, a thriving business. So what she used to do, I still remember seeing her. We, we had, a, because we eventually we moved into hardware and um, uh, building materials business. So my, my father had two little warehouses very near, sort of adjoining our home. And the shop was a bit, a bit further away. So she would, my father would ring her and say, look, can you, uh, I'm sending this gentleman with a note, he'll collect. 20 iron sheets to, to build the, the home. So my mother would actually open the store and ask the servant to count 20 iron sheets or maybe 20 bags of cement. Uh, and so she would supervise all that. So she had a very important role. And she would also support and would, would want to know what's going on in the business. She would have her own ideas. See, my mother had lived in Mumbai and my father had a very small village. So there was a lot of disparity in terms of knowledge and know-how because when she, she still tells me that when, when she came to Masindi from Butyaba, people were walking barefoot. They said, oh, why are these people going to wear some sleepers? At least some sleepers. I know it's quite warm, but at least you must wear some sleepers so you're, you're covering your feet. So she actually established that. Look, you have to wear some sleepers, you know, for, for your feet, the protection of your feet. So they played a very important role. The women role was very important. Even even today, if you look at the businesses, women play a very big role. Even if you come to Leicester or in other cities I've seen, uh, it's a very important role women play. Even though they're at the back, so they never have that profile of running a business, but they, 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 they do run the businesses or they, even today. I meant uh, also, you know, they must have initially, they must have had problems with the language because coming from Gujarat, yes, um, yeah, the, 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 talking to the uh, natives in yes, African yeah. language must have been really difficult. In fact, if you didn't speak the local uh, language, people, the customers would not come to your shop. Mm -hmm. If they realized you only spoke Swahili, they wouldn't come, or even English or whatever, or Gujarati. You have to speak their dialect as well. The most fluent you are, the most successful you are in speaking their language, to come in, to come and buy goods from you. Otherwise, they wouldn't come to your shop. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. Even the women would need to learn because they would have to communicate not only with the customers but the servants who worked at home. Uh, how do you tell him? Look, okay, please cook this chapati this way. So they, they also uh, they had to they, they learn the language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, just uh, uh, can you go a little bit back when you, what was the, from your opinion, why was the strong relationship between Gujarat and East Africa? Sure. Before you arrived there, you know, what was the reason for that, you know? What was the setup? Okay. What has happened was that because people wanted to belong to somewhere, because, so what's happened even with us, lifestyle, with our lifestyle here, is that we are more Indians here than Indians themselves. See, I go to India and I talk to my cousins and say, look, why? Because we have distanced ourselves from India or Gujarat. And, you know, we would like to uh, associate more with Gujarat and the Gujaratis in India uh, simply because we want to, it's in, in our heart. Uh, and you know we we want to maintain those links, and also we want to ensure that our next generation have those links. I know they are they are not very powerful. But when people ask the same question about Uganda, that look, you you left Uganda even though you were deported, but you know you suddenly have affinity to the place where you're born. So my father was born in Gujarat, so he had that affinity to Gujarat, and many others who uh, lived in East Africa, they they wanted to associate themselves with. The Gujaratis, they wanted to know what's going on in Gujarat and, uh, you know, how they would also remember, you know, they had this nostalgic um, uh, links in that way and so look, uh, this is what happens in Gujarat and this is what we do 
uh, and you know they would also try and see in, in the modern days to see some of the Gujarati programs they would go and see some Gujarati plays or uh, some comedy shows which come here as well but they, they used to come there and uh, they, they would love to go and see those plays or, or films uh, in, in Gujarati and maintain the, 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 the linguistic uh, links that were plus there was oh yes uh, this was this how it used to happen in Gujarati even though things have changed drastically in the state of Gujarat now but you know in, in the back of their mind they would say oh no I, I love Gujarat because I was born there I have that affinity and uh, I'll be loyal to, to Gujarat first in the same way as I have towards Uganda even though of, of Gujarati origin <laughs> No, I understand that. But um, but what was the first incentive to go to East Africa? Just the business opportunities, or was there also a, a problem in Gujarat that people had to leave? Um, well, for for some in the eighteen nineties, uh, the British wanted to build railways from Mombasa to uh, Nairobi and then to to Uganda, and they approached the local African tribes and they say we, are not, we will ne not build this iron snake they call it iron snake so the British decided to import well I would say import <laughs> the Indians you know from India uh, especially from Gujarat and other states to to work and build these railways so that's how first of all the Indians were established in, in East Africa uh, where they used to work on these railways and they used to work all sorts of hours and many of them got killed by the lions because it was such a wild country and they suffered quite a bit because you know they were sort of workers and basically they were laborers who used to carry uh, the, the british were the masters and they would instruct them to carry and, and build the railway in the, in the way they wanted it so there, there were literally hundreds and hundreds of indians who went initially for, for that purpose but i think what history doesn't mention is that there are a lot of Gujaratis uh, who were there before Australia, especially in Zanzibar, uh, in Mombasa and Dar es Salaam, where they were before the, the British decided to import the Indians to work on the railways. And their sole purpose was to trade. You know, they were traders and they would trade with Arabs, you know, from the, the sort of, the, if you look at Oman, you know, from the Arabian Peninsula to East African coast. And, uh, the trade, you know, anything from spices and they would exchange goods for something else and so on, or barter something. So th those were the sort of trading links which established and the point which you just raised about, yes, I think some of the people were not doing so well in Gujarat and um, they wanted to have a better life, uh, education and so on. The other thing was the, the, the family link. I think, uh, say for example, if, if someone's my father went to Masindi and so on, and then he sent a passage to my un my uh, uncle. He said, Look, please, you come and uh, come to Africa. It, it, there's a lot of opportunities here, and uh, you know, you'd have a good life here. You make some money, you look after your children, and so on. So one of his uncles did take up the offer, and he came to to Uganda. And then after that, he sent money for the third uncle, and he, he never came. He said, no, no, I don't want to live in India, I want to stay in Gujarat and I'm happy with what I have. So the, the family links brought people from Gujarat to Africa, East Africa. And, and the trading links and also what had happened was that once the railway was built, uh, the Indians who stayed back or didn't, didn't have anything to do, they established shops, Dukawalas, which is, is very famous as well. So and then they started trading with the Africans and supplying the goods which they wanted and that's how they flourished, uh, built schools, hospitals and either through the community uh, and, and, and you know, had a proper living. And then once the children were born there, they, they didn't want to go back to uh, India to live because you see their lifestyle was completely different to their parents and they didn't want to go back to India or Gujarat you know, to, to resettle. And they found it easy to trade with uh, the Africans, even though they had to face a lot of obstacles, for example, no proper medicine, no proper hospitals. Uh, infrastructure in terms of transport was very poor as well. So, you know, they, 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 they suffered quite a bit. They, 
as well and but somehow they made, they made the, the most of it in terms of having a very relaxed lifestyle a good lifestyle which they enjoyed and whenever they wanted to go back to India they would think of the SS Karanja you know, let's <laughs> go back to India they would go there for a few months uh, and then come back you know uh, either with some additional family members or uh, and uh, those sort of links were established but mainly it was to do trade and, and make money and have a good life I think the distinct feature of the Bora community is this Jamaat Bandi, the communal yes. solidarity. Because yes. one person goes and he calls the family and then the other, other the cousins and, and then and you stick together. And yes. for, perhaps that is the secret of your uh, success stories. Uh, well, thank you for the time for mentioning it. I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think because, see, the Daudi Boras, uh, we, are, we are a Shia sect of Islam. And we are the follower of Sayyid Namfadul Saifuddin. Now, we come under his jurisdiction in terms of our guidance and how we live, what, what we do, what we, do, we can't do. And he is always, traditionally, he has always encouraged people to live together uh, as one, help each other. And we've got our own system to, to help in, in, in education, in, in finance. And so if they wanted to borrow money, he wouldn't think of going to the bank first. Yeah, he would borrow from, from the community funds. But he doesn't have to pay any interest. Uh, so if, if somebody wanted some help in, say, matrimonial help, then we, we have our own network uh, throughout the world, uh, where you know, the Boras are settled in, in America, in Australia. Uh, and uh, we have the very strong links in terms of making sure that everybody helps each other, not only uh, in finance, in every other aspect. If somebody dies, then everything is catered for, looked after. Uh, so we, we have those community links, which is very, very strong. And uh, I think I may have mentioned earlier that, you know, wherever we build a mosque, uh, uh, you know, we, we build a few shops as well. Uh, so we pays for the running of the mosque. Plus we build some homes around it. So we're all nearby, you know, we utilize the facilities of the mosque, and then we probably network very close, Liu has one family, uh, which is a strong bond. And we've always done that for so many years. Even if you go to uh, Nairobi now, for example, you know, we've got a special place called Langata, which has got hundreds of Bora families living in one area, one colony. If you go to Mumbai, I think majority of them are settled in Bindi Bazaar. But we are, the Sayyid has declared that he's going to redevelop uh, Bindi Bazaar into a, a new complex where our community will reside and, and live together uh, and trade because I think majority of the, the, the Boras are traders uh, and uh, even today even though many you know, those who settle in the West have been moved into professions you know, doctors, lawyers, accountants and but still trading is, 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 is a great thing and, and the the Bori the Bori word comes from Gujarat, from the, from the word Gujarat means a trader, and that's basically what we are. I mean, wherever if you go to Sri Lanka, if you go to Singapore, you'll find our community members trading. Uh, even the small traders, uh, but uh, uh, good traders. And the other thing was the trust element and and, and respect as well. Uh, even though we trade with, for example, in Africa, in our with Africans. In India, with the, with the Hindus and the Christians and so on, whoever come, uh, no, we, they would have a respect for a trust uh, and also integrity. Uh, I know, yeah, I'm not saying 100%, but majority would, would, would have this established sort of trust and, and, and also links with the host community. And we still have that. I mean, presently, you know, in fact, when Mr. Modi was the uh, CM of Gujarat, he used to meet Sayed, our leader Sayed, very regularly. And Sayed used to go and see him as well. So, you know, even though despite uh, we had some reservations about what happens to rioting, but he maintained very close link with Sayed. Uh, even when Sayed, uh, Sayed Brahmin passed away the last Sayed, he himself, uh, Mr. Modi, personally went to Mumbai to pay his respect uh, to his son. So, because he knew that this is a trading community, they wouldn't be involved in anything against the state, and they are loyal citizens of India. So, you know, he, he would um, 
uh, have that respect. Uh, and not only, but you know, say the Brahmin died or passed away. The, uh, he, he was wrapped, uh, his body was wrapped in Indian flag, uh, despite that, uh, you know, the mistrust between the, the Muslims and Hindus in so certain parts of India. But he commanded, the Sayyidina commanded a lot of respect with the Indian government, and he was given, um, I think, nine or ten guns salute as well. Uh, so uh, it's, the Boras are respected uh, in India and in many other parts of the world as well. Mm. Well said. talked about your um, schooling in, in um, Uganda. Yes, uh, can you tell us a bit about the social sector of the, um, the British, the Indians and Africans? How, how was that um, uh, in, in, in Uganda in those days? Okay, yes, it's a very good question you're asking again. Uh, it's, um, if, if you came to the city village where, where I was born and where I spent quite a bit of my time, you'd come to a, a very posh area of Masindi, which is on the hill, and very big houses, uh, with beautiful gardens and uh, lots of space to live in and so on. They all would be for the British and the English, or who would probably be judges or uh, headmasters or doctors or lawyers or you know, in very senior positions. And they would have their own servants, they would have car parking you know, for their garages and so on. And then if you came down from Sydney from the hill to Sort of middle area, you'll find all the Indians living together, <laughs> and because uh, I mentioned to you earlier, the majority of the Indians settled in Uganda, the Gujaratis, there are a few Punjabis, um, so you'd have that distinct area where you'd only see Indians there. If you, if you walked in the town, there was all where the Indians would get together and having a chat, or the women would having a, a small chat outside there, what we call the veranda, <laughs> sit outside. <laughs> and talk about, you know, everything that goes on in, in, in a small town. And then if you go down into the, the sort of left side of Masindi, you'd find, you come to a shanty town and the Africans would, would live there. And, you know, they would not have proper water supply and um, uh, their, their homes would be very shanty, a lot of children, uh, there's no proper uh, facilities and also cleaning those areas and so on. So. We have three distinct areas, and I think they still exist. If you, even if you go to Kampala, you'll see three distinct areas. So, and, and the, what British cleverly did was to use the India or the Asian community to communicate with the Africans, and the Africans would communicate, use the Indians to communicate with the white, the British. Uh, you know, that's that's how there are three distinct uh, areas, and, and the, how the, the British used the Indian community. They would not have a direct link. Uh, with the Africans, and the Africans would not have a direct link with the uh, with the white. The other thing, if you look at the salary structure or the pay structure of any organization which exists in anything from schools to hospitals to wherever, you'll find there's three scales of pay. Uh, the, uh, say a white person would get say a hundred pounds for doing that job, and the same job an Indian would do it for sixty pounds maybe, and an African would do it for around twenty twenty five pounds. So they had this this sort of scale, even though uh, the skills required would be the same, whether it's done by an Indian or by an African or by the white person. So you know, uh, this was ingrained uh, in in the society for so many years, very similar to apartheid system in South Africa, which eventually I think was <laughs> dismantled, but obviously not not two hundred percent. You know, that exists even today. But but obviously it's a lesser. Uh, in a sort of lesser scale than what it used to be in, in the colonial days. So this kind of social sector, I suppose, was a trigger uh, to the, the expulsion um, period. Would you, would you say that? Yes, partly, yes, of course, because, you see, uh, whenever I talk to 
Prince Solomon who used to study with me and he said, he said Jaffa, and he used to tell me he was a prince and he was you know, sitting next to me in the classroom. He said, Jaffa, there are a lot of Indians in this country. I said, why are you saying that? He said, look, when I come to Masjid town, all I see is the Indians. What he was failing to realize that the Indians lived in a very small area all together. And yes, he was right in that respect. But nationally, we are only about 80,000 men, women and children out of 10 million. You know, only 80,000. I'm talking about 1972. So they had this image that a lot of Indians had taken over the country. And this was primarily because, you know, we, we controlled the economy of the country. You know, we, we controlled the retailing, we controlled the wholesaling, we controlled the manufacturing. But the good thing the Indian community did that was that you know they would employ and give opportunity to the locals you know to uh, gain the knowledge skills even in business as well because for example, my father in fact when he was in Masindi, he had set up another shop while he was in Masindi. and he employed uh, an African uh, who's to learn the trade and, and to do the business but unfortunately he he wasn't very successful uh, because his interest wasn't primarily in the business you know he's there's more to do with his enjoy the life today, you know, why, why worry about tomorrow? You know, they say in, in Swahili, Keso Mungu, means tomorrow God is there, so why worry, just enjoy the life today. So, you know, they had that principle. But with the Indians, the thing was they were hardworking people, very committed people, committed to the family life, committed to the business, committed to expanding the business, and thinking about the future generation, making sure that the children are much better living or having much better education than themselves had, much better living than they have had. So they had sort of something to climb for, but the, the, the Africans, they didn't have that. Even today, the problem is that the Africans, they say that the Indians are not giving the opportunity to trade, which is not true, because it is their country and they control everything. In fact, to control the expansion of the businesses, what they established was that they would not give you license to trade in, ma in many small towns, you know, at one time. Just, just before even Idi Amin came to power, they controlled the issue of license to the Indians to trade, especially those who were not holding the, the Ugandan passports. So they had that in mind. In fact, in 19, if you check the history, in 1956, in Kampala, the Buganda people uh, declared uh, under the king, uh, Kabaka, is that they would boycott all the Indian shops. They would not, yeah, they would not go to any of the Indian shops because the old settled Kampala was again Indians ma mainly of Gujarati origin, uh, you know, doing wheeling and dealing in business and so on. And it just lasted just a few months, and people just gave up. They said, "No, oh, we can't survive without the Indians, uh, the Indian business community." So. I mean, in terms of when Idi Amin he came to power in 1971, and before that, even Obote used to make noises as well. That look, these Indians are controlling the trade, even though he had closely with Madhwani family, who had a, it was such a large enterprise. Uh, I mean, they employed over 20,000 people when we were there. And you know, the sugarcane estate was 20 miles long and 20 miles wide uh, in Kakira. Uh, and um, the Mehta group. There was Sar Abu Pevai, there were, there were quite a few other very, I mean, there were few, but they, they had thriving businesses. Even in timber, there was in, in the Sengil, you know, he controlled the timber trade. But the Africans were, were not quite were happy with that at all. They said, look, these guys are exploiting us and they are actually uh, not helping us either. So Obote, this was happening in Obote's time, Pastor Obote. And when Amin came to power, in 1971 and then in and then he uh the point which was mentioned earlier was that he started marrying from each tribe because you know he wanted to unite the people of uganda and this i mean this is i believe that happens in many other parts of the world where the king decides that i want to marry from every tribe so i can unite the, the community so he applied the same rule so he started marrying somebody from baganda tribe which was an exclusive uh very high-ranking tribe in Africa, in fact, the whole of Africa, the Baganda, they're highly educated, very well established, you know, very skilled people as well. 
So he married Bugan and then he married uh, some from other tribes as well. And then he suddenly had an eye for an Indian lady as well. So he knew that uh, there was a widow of uh, giant Madhwani, again a very powerful family in, in, in Uganda. And he wanted to marry Meena Ben, who was the widow. And as soon as Meena Ben got the wind, she just left Kampala, or, and, sorry, in Jinja, where she was staying. So all night just disappeared. And uh, Amin got really angry with that. This, the second thing which happened was that uh, he, he, he wanted money for his army. And since uh, uh, Uganda was going downhill in terms of economy, so he encouraged the Indian people to, to contribute towards his army and so on, but very few did. I mean, because uh, the Indians were saying, look, you're already taxing us. We pay enough taxes to businesses and everything else we pay. Are you asking us additional tax to, for your army? And some did contribute, some of the big businesses, they did contribute, but the majority didn't contribute anything towards his army's role. And what was happening in the army, we all knew that he, what he did was to buy Scotch whiskey and he, the plane loads from Stansted Airport would go to <laughs> Entebbe full of Scotch whiskey and all the gins and so on. So people were not very happy and he, he wasn't happy either. And the other things which he started uh, in his mind was that these, these Indians are sending money abroad. I think he named the Ismaili community and the Patel community in that they are sending money. Uh, abroad, that you know they are actually making huge profits and sending money abroad. So, I think he was a terror of Barak. I mean, one evening in nineteen sorry in nineteen seventy two, I think in September. I think first week in September, I think. And uh, next morning, you know, we heard on the radio that uh, Idi Amin saying that he had a dream, in which uh, God instructs him to deport all the. Indians uh, from the country and uh, the reason he gave was they were sabotaging the economy of the country, they were milking the economy, they were not integrating with their host community, uh, they were not marrying uh, and, and, and so on. He gave quite a few other examples in you know, the sending money abroad and that this country it belongs to us. You know very similar to what Mr. Trump is doing in America where everything is American and America belongs to the American. He said, Uganda belongs to the Africans and that uh, everything should be run and managed by the Africans themselves. So, and obviously when I heard this on the radio, I was with my father, so we just started to laugh. You know, we said, this must be a joke. There is no way uh, this can be implemented. Um, so, we just, you know, Led a normal life, you know. We said, okay, fine, you know, what, what's, what's he going to do to us? You know, is he going to survive without us? Because, you know, we are the backbone of the, the country. Okay, we were, we were small, I mean, my father was a small retailer or a wholesaler, but there were a, lot, a, few, a few very big businesses as well. How is he going to manage those? What about the professions, you know, the doctors, lawyers, accountants, you know, who we need uh, all those as well? So, how is he going to survive without us? But you know, things got hotter. So what he did was to imprison uh, Manubai Madwani, who was the, the richest man in, 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 in Uganda. So he he uh, decided, well, he actually did that. He imprisoned Manubai Madwani with uh, one of the ITN uh, newscasters, his name was Sandy Go. They, they put him in the, in, in the same cell, the prison cell. So that scared us, you know. They said, look, if this guy can attack a well, very powerful and very honest and sincere businessman uh, and put him inside. So that's, we decided to think, oh, we really have to leave this country now. My father wasn't ready at all, you know, because he, he always believed in that, look, I made my money in this country and I'm going to spend it in this country because the money belongs to this country. And I think quite a few did. I mean, there are also Indian workers, you know, who were, we're not that rich, you know, they were just working for either the Indian companies or in some of the African enterprises or British enterprises. There are a lot of British companies there, you know, Dalgetty and all those, they, they were there and they're working for, for, for this big firm. So, so the, the, even the Indian community, they were not all of them, not, not that rich, but they were sizable, they were quite wealthy. 
So, you know, it really scared us. Once Manubai was in prison, I said, look, uh, what shall we do now? Because we don't want to go to England. Uh, because it is a very cold country and whether they will accept us and all, and all those questions. When we used to hear it on the BBC, once it was announced, when Idi Amin had announced that we will be deported. And also he mentioned the 10 million pound aid which the British government had promised him and they were not giving giving that money to him. And this was again this, a revenge attack, but then he mentioned all these, you know, sabotaging the economy um, and milking the economy, not integrating all those you know, <laughs> points he mentioned. Uh, so the next problem was, you know, how do we reach, how do we get the visa to, because the British had imposed the visa system on us, so they were saying, okay, uh, you are British, so you just come over and you know, we'll look after you now. You have to go through the visa system. So there was long queues out of, out outside the British High Commission. So you had a British passport? Yes, very British passport, but we had to have a visa. The to whole community? The whole? I think quite a lot. I would say just a few had the Ugandan passport, very few. I, I wouldn't know the number. So he, you know, we had to wait outside the British High Commission we to get the visa to come here. And we had to queue. And what the Amin's men used to do was to, uh, because we had to queue maybe for the whole day or the, uh, sometimes even overnight, so we would have a lunchbox water with us or pick, some other Indians would come and help us, you know, bring us. So they would steal this from us, you know, they, they would not even, the Amin's men would not even allow us to, to eat outside while we were waiting the, to get our visa. Uh, the other problem was the number of flights, you know, there, there weren't that enough flights to bring us all here. Who's going to organize that? So, and, and obviously, British High Commission was the, 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 the High Commission was active. But there's a problem in this country because I don't think initially Mr. Heath's government was was happy to allow us in for you know, for his political reasons. Uh, and if you look at the cabinet papers, the thirty in those 1972s, you'll find that. Uh, Edward Heath was talking in the cabinet to send us either to Falkland Islands or to Fiji Islands or to Solomon Islands. He didn't want any one of us to come here. <laughs> Obviously, he was trying to salvage himself from the, from the uh, political uh, comeback if he allows uh, 30, 30,000, 30, 40,000 people to come into the country suddenly and the impact it will have uh, on, on, on the social services and education system and all the other aspects. So he, he wasn't very happy with that either. Maybe he knew inside that these are refugees and they are British passport holders, they, they have to come here. They can't go anywhere else. No other country will, India would not accept. They, Indira Gandhi said very clearly that we don't want, these are British subjects, so let them go to England. This is Indira Gandhi, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, yes, and so, uh, and, 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 and technically she was right, because you're British, so let the British come and take the responsibility. So we, so we had to go through all this. You can see how shocked we were and how nervous we were. Uh, and it's very difficult to describe those feelings, especially those 90 days uh, we had to go through. Because somebody asked Edie Amin, why have you given these people 90 days to leave? And he says, look, these Indians have the habit of giving 90 days credit, so let's, <laughs> let's give them 90 days to live. Because the Israelis previously who were there, he gave them 24 hours to leave the country. You see, they fell out with uh, the, the, the Israelis. Uh, when it was very close to Mosse Dayan, the Israeli, and he was one of the ministers of the defense minister, I think. He was very close with him in those days, but then suddenly he fell out. You see, my father, I know my father mentioning them, look, if this guy has got the courage to ask the Israelis to live in 24 hours, so what about us? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so anyway, the, the preparations began and as you can imagine the state of the Indians there, very few, about 80,000 in the country, about 30,000 holding British passports. And the journalists coming into you know, from various countries coming to interview Idi Amin, and somebody will, I still remember somebody was asking Idi Amin, said, "Look, uh, if they don't leave, what will you do with these Indians?" Uh, he said, "I'll, 
I, I'll teach them a lesson, he says. I said, yeah, so what will you do? And then this general was telling, would you set up camps? I said, yes, yes, I'll set up camps for, for them. So, uh, and then somebody said, would you set up camps in line with what Hitler did, you know, in concentration? He said, yeah, I'll do that as well. So, you know, he was moving into that direction. The problem with the Indians said that, you know, they said, okay, you can sell your goods, but who's going to buy it? You know, the Africans didn't have the money to buy, for example, our TV sets or our cars and so on, and all the crockery and cutlery we had, we built up for so many years, uh, they didn't have the money to buy. What about our properties? They didn't have the money to buy those properties. Our businesses, no, they didn't have money to buy our stock. So all those fears, you can see what the Indian Committee was going through, uh, the waiting at the British High Commission. And what, you know, and, and this is really embarrassing as well, that, you know, it comes 10 o'clock, they would shut the High Commission office for the tea break. Comes, and they knew there were hundreds of people waiting outside. And some of them have slept all night. Some of them coming from villages like mine, Masindi, and Lira, and all the other towns. And then comes one o'clock, it's closed again for the lunch break, and they'll come back at what, about two, half past two. And while we're just waiting outside to get our visas to come here. So <coughs> eventually, when I think uh, the British government sent uh, one of the ministers to negotiate with Idi Amin on how they're going to deal with the transit of these people from here. Uh, and they set up extra flights and, and how and, and how do we manage all that. You know, so there was some, some help there. But you know, we used to listen to BBC, which we relied on, you know, in terms of <coughs> getting the accurate picture of what was happening here. And uh, <coughs> I still remember uh, National Front being very active. Mr. Is it Tabit who who spoke against us? Sorry, big about him. I'm, I'm going to go to right. <laughs> who openly was saying that we must not bring these people in this country. They don't belong here. Uh, and there'll be race riots and rivers of blood and all those speeches being made by Mr. Powell. They say rivers, rivers of blood. So river of blood. So it really, we really got scared. And I said, look, here's British people. They don't want us there. They can't go back to India. Where will we go? You know. Uh, so you can imagine. Plus, very, very little. You know, my father had, we had five brothers, two sisters. So it was a big family, um, all very young. Uh, and what will you do? Um, when you, um, where will you get our next meal from, even if you leave? The other problem was, you know, so even we say, okay, fine, we'll wind everything up and go. And we were the last ones to leave because my father didn't want to leave Uganda because he said, look, I don't want to, I've been here for 40, 40 45 years, and this is my home. I don't want to leave Uganda. So he wasn't prepared even mentally, so you can see what he must have gone through. Um, so the other problem which we had to, was the roadblocks. You know, we, we had to go through all the roadblocks, which Amin's men had set up. And uh, these soldiers, you know, were about 18, 19 years old soldiers, they used to harass us. And they used to steal whatever you had. Sometimes you know, they would, uh, some of the women would wear anything in the ear, so they would just take it out, you know, without even asking them to remove, you know, so you can see what the torture was going on. And quite a few oh, pe people suffered uh, through the roadblock because they were looted again <laughs> by Idi Amin soldiers, but there was not only one roadblock, there were so many, I would say 20, 30 before we reached uh, Entebbe. But in very lucky, my, in my father's case, what happened was that he came to the first roadblock and um, there was an army man, I said army colonel, he was, he was a senior rank. And he saw my father, he said, apparently, what are you doing here? I said, look, I'm going to England. He said, uh, he said you, you have to pass all those roadblocks now. So what I'll do is, because you've always been good to me, I'll sit in your minibus in the front so nobody will stop you. And that's what he did. He came with us to Entebbe. So it was just lucky that we were not looted on the way to Entebbe Airport. But there are so many horror stories from so many different people. So, you know, 
they were showing guns uh, on their neck you know, and, and uh, some of the all the women and all the children were thrown off their vehicle and then they were looted and everything good was taken away from them so those horror stories will remain uh, but the other thing we, we talk about Idi Amin was that uh, okay he was able to deport us and there were about four or five Asians who were killed uh, one was the I believe uh, Anil Clark uh, he was killed and there was Inspector Hassan he was killed during that time but if you take stock of the Africans who were killed during Idi Amin's time, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, probably the figures mentioned are 300,000 to five, about half a million who were killed or slaughtered by uh, Idi Amin in, in that time. So the suffering of Africans was much more than Ugandan nations. Why, why did he kill Africans? For him to remain in power, because you see, he came from, uh, in fact, he wasn't educated, I think he gathered that, and, and um, he came from a place called Kwakpwa and near Arua and he joined the king's African rifles during uh, King George's time so we we had that arm which he joined and then he was in the army then and he kept the British kept on promoting him knowing full well that he's mentally uh, there's a problem with him uh, so so when he came to power he came to Kampala he realized that there was the Bagandas you know who were the leading brain of Uganda and you know they're highly educated people who had the skills to in fact run the country and I'll give you some of the examples of what, what the British did the reason why the, the Bagandas were educated and uh, they had all the infrastructure and they had all the help from the British was because the king was very friendly with the British the king I come from king in fact uh, Sir Tito Vini he was the king when we were there and he, his father, King Kabalega, he wasn't happy in British conquering his tribal land. And he fought back. In fact, if you look at the history, he had a 14-year battle with the British. And he was fighting with spears remember, uh, and uh, shields. And it, against him was the guns. So, but he fought for 14 years. I mean, I, it's, I think it's in the British history as well. And eventually he was defeated. So in revenge, you know, they didn't develop our part of Bunyoro. It was, even if you go today, uh, it's not developed at all. I mean, we have some tarmac roads and, and, and maybe uh, they're, they're going to build an international um, airport in Hoima. But otherwise, you know, we had very poor infrastructure. Uh, no proper hospitals, education w wasn't very good. I mean, the school where we went to Kabalega was built by the Americans, uh, and that was the best school in the area. So, you see, he, the, the, the Banyoro people, where I come from, we were deprived of uh, any advancement in uh, education, infrastructure, and all aspects of life. But, but the Boganda has benefited, you know, they, 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 they thrived, they were, they were also in good business, they were, you know, they were good judges, and so on, you know, and, and even if you go to Kampala today, you find that you talk to Boganda people, they, you'll soon realize that. So what Amin did was to get rid of this, either dip, dip or get, get, get rid of by killing a few of them so the rest go, go away. And because Uganda was based on very tribal affiliations rather than any other affiliation, the first affiliation was tribal. So he, uh, Idi Amin, was able to kill lots of people of other tribes. So he, he and, and then he would put his own men in, for example, General Moses and all the, the all from his tribe, who would c control the, the administration and the government. Uh, so that that's what he did. Uh, just to remain in power uh, and he realized that the Indians were not interested in politics at all they would have kept away from all they wanted to was make money have a good life they, they were not interested in politics at all what about the independence what was what was the role of the Indians in the independence movement to be honest very little I think indirectly yes yeah I think they followed the, the Mahatma Gandhi's principles being independent but obviously 
inspired by India and many of these African countries became independent. But to be honest, very little direct role in, 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 in uh, making sure that uh, Uganda becomes uh, independent. Uh, that, 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 that's yeah, even, uh, it's true today as well because the Gujaratis, majority of them are Gujaratis and they are not interested in politics at all. They kept away, uh, which uh, is an eye-opener because even in today's world, I think we, we need to get involved in politics. We, we need to have a say you know, in, 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 in parliament or wherever and you know, we must make input into what we think and how we think. Yeah. What African did was to uh, make sure that the Africans get the top priority in business and also in other aspects as well. Senior positions within the government and the other authorities, health authority and all that aspect. They wanted to make sure that Africanization means Africans are in charge and they control those de government departments, the businesses and so on. What it also meant was that <clears throat> they restricted the number of licenses they issued uh, to the in Indian community, especially those who are British citizens. They had to struggle to get a license to trade uh, because every year you had to renew your trading license and they would say, sorry, uh, we will not renew your license this year or you can't sell this or you go to move somewhere else, uh, give the Africans top priority. Uh, and uh, also the government's idea, the uh, idea was to, to make sure that the Africans do take control uh, of that aspect of life in, uh, as mentioned, business and commerce and in um, medicine and, 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 and the civil service and so on. But in reality, it, it, it never, it, it, it wasn't a successful uh, outcome because the, the what we found out was that the Africans were not really interested in trading. They just wanted to enjoy life and whatever money they can make. Uh, and you see, with Uganda, the other thing that you could remember is that you could survive without earning much money. Because many of the Africans in the villages are where I come from, was they would grow their own cash crop of, of fruit crop, you know, they would, whatever they want to eat, whether they want to eat cassava or bananas or whatever, uh, they would grow in their own little farm uh, at, at the back of their hut and uh, they would just utilize that to, to, to survive. And whatever surplus they would have in food, uh, they would sell it in the local market, get some money to buy clothing, uh, or maybe a bicycle uh, and, and that, 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 that was the daily living. And if they wanted to make some wine, they would, they would do it at home uh, rather than, you know, buy from a pub or a wine merchant or whatever, they would not spend money there. And they, they wouldn't be worried about the, the school fees or anything like that because uh, they would ask the children, you know, to work in the farms or in the little, uh, whatever they have in the back of the, the, the garden. So, so they could survive. And for, for them it was an easy life rather than getting involved in all the other aspects of uh, running a business and all the stress uh, and strain you, know, you go through running a, a business. And they were not interested in that. And that's you know, my view of it. And I think this has been tried even in Tanzania when Julius Nere uh, decided to nationalize all the uh, British and the Indian businesses and he thought that once these uh, uh, the, the Indians have given the businesses to the Africans and Africans would prosper, it never happened. Uh, because particularly Julius Nere was following the socialist policies, uh, doctrine by uh, maybe Russians and Chinese who, who were in his, especially the Chinese who were there in his country. Uh, and Obose followed Nerele uh, in, in implementing some of these measures and it was total failure uh, and in the, you can see even today after so many 40 after 40 44 years in Uganda they still require our skills they invited us back uh, President Museveni has been to Leicester twice to encourage the Gujarati because he knows the Gujarati population live in Leicester so he's encouraging us to go back and before that you know President Museveni visited the the Nisden Temple. Again, he knew that uh, in the 
family, a lot of Gujaratis, the East African Gujarats, particularly from Uganda, were settled and encouraging them to come back. You know, he came to the temple, uh, and uh, there was a mass, massive big gathering, and in which uh, he declared that you know, please come back. You know, the, all the doors are open, and uh, where applicable, we'll give you your properties back. Uh, uh, so, but please welcome home and come back. And, and whenever I met him, he said, "Look, you are a Munyoro, which is the tribe where." Uh, I grew up and said, you, you, you must not live in England, your home is Bunioro, you must come home. Uh, so, you know, one a president would not do that if uh, there was any success in taking over businesses and all, all other aspects of life. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Just, uh, um, I asked you before about the Bora community. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about the specific of your community? Sure. Uh, you see, the, the Bora, as I mentioned earlier, are, are traders, you know, internationally. And even though we originate from the state of Gujarat, uh, particularly Kathiawad area. And uh, business is ingrained in us because our parents do trade, train us to, to do business, you know, to, to be wheelers and dealers uh, in, uh, in life. And the first thing the teacher says, um, look, you must not look at anyone else as, oh, he's a Mongolian, I'm going to uh, trade with him, or he's a Chinese, or he's a Russian. You just look at it as a fellow human being, uh, and humanity comes from comes first in, in Islam. So that's your religion, humanity. And then you work and integrate, uh, uh, and know their cu customs, respect their customs, know their religion, respect their religion, and trade with them. Uh, because we don't, want to, uh, we don't want to lose a customer because he feels that this guy is, is a Muslim and he's, he's not going to treat me well. So you know you have to create that confidence and trust in your customer, and that's what that's been ingrained in us. So that's why you find uh, that the, 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 the Bohras or the Bohri community are very successful in business. Uh, I can give you some examples in London. Uh, Lord Gulamno, the late Lord Gulamno, uh, he was a very successful business. He's one of the very rich businessmen, but you know he. When, when the Nistan temple opened, he supplied milk for the first nine days to all the worshippers who came to the temple. Uh, he's coming from the Bori background, and he was open to that. You know, so he, he made sure that he respected the religion, uh, and that he also said, "Look, I will uh, contribute. My contribution would be this uh, to, to, to the Swaminarayan uh, group of people." Uh, and there's so many other examples in, in internationally. We, so we built a, a hospital, a safety hospital in Mumbai, which is in the oldest part of Mumbai. And that's the only building which has got three floors underground. And if you get the opportunity, please do visit it. And 90% of the people who work there are non-Muslims. So actually it's the, it's the Hindus who control the safety hospital. In fact, it was opened by Prime Minister Manmohan Singh when he, he was the, the Prime Minister. And when I met the Prime Minister in, in uh, India House, uh, when he was the Prime Minister, the first thing he mentioned when I, I said that I'm from the Bora community, he said, oh, I opened your hospital, which is a state-of-the-art hospital in Mumbai, uh, and I'm so pleased, uh, and that um, uh, it's one of the cleanest hospitals in India. So that's, that's how the Bora community have contributed, and in, 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 in not only, I mean, okay, we are successful business people, and we have created the trust and confidence in other communities, whether they're Christians and Hindus or uh, other groups of people who, who will trade with us. In fact, I'll give you another example of uh, the, the trading colleagues which our community have. I, I met uh, two South Russian girls in London the other day, and they're converted to our group, uh, they converted to Islam, and they're Orthodox Christians. Uh, and I asked them, I said, look, how come you know, you converted to us? Uh, what links did you have? Because you, you lived in South Russia. I told you, I think it's Uzbek, Uzbek, so I can't remember the name of the, the country, but it's one of those South, South Russian countries, or former South African, Russian countries. And he said, you won't believe me, he said, uh, the, how, why we decided to convert to you, uh, brand of Islam. He said, look, uh, the company they were working for, they used to trade with the Bori businessmen in Hong Kong. 
and this is that's how we came into touch with them and this is they were so good to us and they really looked after us and and uh, there was so, so much communication between us that we said look this religion must be the best <laughs> so we decided to came out to your group of uh, Daudi Boras uh, and uh, the, the, in fact uh, I was amazed at that, that you know that the business uh, links can create somebody to convert to our group. <laughs> and the, the Russian thinker said, I said, what about your parents? You know, you, you know, your parents, we, they're Orthodox Christians. He said, yeah, they oppose it, but we are fully committed. And we'll wear your veils and we'll decide your prayers and we believe in Sayyidina, right? Sayyidina Muhammad Brahmin, and you know, they will do everything which is required. Uh, her name is Lulua, uh, which was given by the side of the name, uh, when she, she became a Muslim. So the, the trading links can help <laughs> expand the faith. But that, that's how we've been brought up, you know, to, to respect uh, all the other people uh, and with equal equality. Yeah. I think what we wanted to also want to know is about the, the, the origins of the Bora community, how you were converted. Uh, you were Yes, yeah. Uh, to, uh, I'll trace my family history and we find that my ancestors were Brahmins. They were living in sort of uh, Kambat area. So this is where the first conversion of Daudi Boras took place. Uh, one of the Imams from Iran came to Kambat and uh, his sole aim was for conversion. And uh, he, when he reached uh, Gujarat, he he came to a time when there was famine in that area uh, and he asked the local farmer, can I have some water? And he said, Look, there's no water. Uh, and you can see the land is all dry. We, we can't grow any uh, crops either. So he said, but I need some water to drink. I'm very really thirsty. He said, but I can see a well in the corner. Uh, can I have some water from the well? He said, no, you can't because there's no, there's no water in there. So he said, okay, take me to the well. And uh, and then he uh, the, this imam he looked in, inside the, into the well and said, okay, so please help me. I need a rope and I will go down uh, and then see what the problem is. So he went down the well and he, he was able to open up uh, some blockage, uh, water preventing coming up. And he did that. He came out and this particular farmer said, look, you, you know, uh, you are a miracle man. How did you get? all this water in this well when there was no water in that area. So he said, look, my mission here is to convert to Islam. He said, look, I'll be your first convert. And then he took advice from this farmer on how do I convert the others. He said, look, you can't do it because you, know, you will be killed if, uh, if you did that. <laughs> but he said, my idea, the, the, this farmer's idea, is that you, know, you convert our king, a local king, his name was Parmo. Uh, then it would be much easier for you. So he said, how do I reach this? I said, talk to his brother, meet his brother, and just go down as a, an ordinary person, you know, as a traveler, meet him. And that's what he did. And he converted, his name was Tarmal, he converted him first. And then eventually when one day King Bharmal, when he saw his younger brother, you know, worshipping, you know, uh, kneeling down before uh, and facing Kaaba, he said, look, what are you doing? He said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a convert now, I'm a Muslim. He said, what? You can't do that. And he explained all the reasons and, and he said, okay, fine. And then eventually, after a lot of time, he converted to Islam and with him, uh, or the, the, the Bauri sect of, because we, we are Shia Muslims, and literally tens of thousands of others converted once the king was converted. That's how uh, you know, we were converted. And my, my forefathers come from the Brahmin, one of the sects of Brahmin. I can't remember the name of the particular sect. But I know, I, in fact, I was in India in December and I was told by some of my Hindu friends, look, you were this particular uh, group of Brahmins, so you, you come from the ancestry. Uh, so that's how the, the Boris. <laughs> uh, but I think even today, you, 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 you can check back the surnames, you'll find that the same surnames are used by um, uh, the, the Brahmins in India. And, um, and also, the other Hindus also respect us because uh, we were the 
the Brahmins, I mean, uh, uh, in, ex in Leicester, the experience which I have, I, I, went, I, I go to a shop, is, in fact, he, he runs a business, and his name is Kantibai, and as soon as I enter his shop, he is, stands up, he's sitting in a the corner there, and he's trying, in sort of his PC. So his secretary asked him, he said, look, this, this uh, capacity walks into your shop, and why do you stand up? Uh, he says, do you know why? He says, he's a Brahmin. Uh, and he's going to bring good luck to my shop. I, I said, look, what do you mean? And he, he would say, look, you know, you, you, you guys, I know from my friends and my grandfathers and so on, that you guys were Brahmins before. Uh, and I had this experience before as well when I was in Mumbai and uh, this was in June, July, when there was a monsoon. And uh, nobody would stand, a uh, taxi, you know, you have, you just, you, sign for a taxi and you know wave your arms or nobody would stand for a, because it's uh, raining so heavily and uh, so one day my wife and I was standing outside in Mumbai and then we, we kept on beckoning for a taxi and eventually after about half an hour when we were soaking wet you know in monsoon <laughs> the taxi stood uh, and I said look okay fine where do you want I said, look, we want to go to Bindi Bazaar I said okay fine I'll take you there and I asked him, I said, why, why did you, because I said, we must, we must have passed about 30, 40 taxis have passed through. They were all vacant, they would not stand, they would not stop. And uh, he said, look, do you know, you, you were Brahmins before and I'm a Brahmin as well. So that's the reason I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> so you see that loyalty there. But uh, you see, I mean, uh, if, if you go to Gujarat in this particular area, they will tell you exactly which sect of uh, Brahmins be aware. But, but you're talking about the Dawoodi. Uh, no, yes. Yeah. Uh, is, is that, uh, there's, uh, there's a, 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 one, one, one line is the Dawoodi and the other one are the Sunni. Yes, there's also yeah, the Sunni group as well. But what happened just to go back before we came to India was that uh, we were based in Yemen, you know, the present uh, Yemen and North Yemen. Before that we were in Cairo. The, uh, and before that we were in Medina and then Mecca. But we originated from, if you go to Prophet Rasulullah Sallallahu time, his daughter Fatima. And that's why we are called Fatimid because we follow Maulana Ali. He was the cousin of Prophet Muhammad. And he was also the son-in-law of Prophet Muhammad. And Fatima was the, the daughter who made uh, Maulana Ali. So we follow that line of uh, succession and following so which is that's why you know we, we are the Shias because we believe in Mullah Ali as the uh, successor to Prophet Muhammad and uh, after the death of the Prophet obviously uh, Mullah Ali eventually uh, well in fact according to the Sunni uh, tradition they classify him as the fourth in Caliphate we classified fast. So we follow the, the Fatimid or uh, sort of Jewish disciplines for Islam and you know we and we follow that because of Mullah Ali and uh, Fatima being the daughter of the Prophet. So if you look at the history of Islam, you know, the Fatimid Imams they ruled North Africa for around two hundred and twenty five years. And that was the most glorious period in Islam, uh, and we are we are in that particular group of uh, Muslims, and we are called Fatimids because we follow Mulan Ali, and then eventually we from Egypt or the North Africa we moved to Yemen, and then uh, in Yemen there are a lot of divisions within the the group within the Shia group, uh, the infight, a lot of infighting. So one of the Sayyidnas, he said, the most peaceful country uh, in those days, about 450 years ago, was India and particularly Gujarat. So he said, I'll move my headquarters from Yemen to Gujarat in Ahmed Ahmedabad in Gujarat because that was considered the most peaceful people and most hospitable people. So for a group who is living in Yemen, they've never been to Gujarat saying that, you know, I would like to set up my HQ in Ahmedabad. And that's what they did. It took them quite a few years to move the HQ from North Yemen 
to Gujarat, Ahmedabad. And uh, so that's how we established, uh, as a faith was established in India. And then obviously our forefathers followed this particular um, brand of Shiaism, the Fatimid Shias, we call Fatimid Shias. And uh, so if you go to Ahmedabad, you know, you'll see all the history there uh, in terms of all of the dais who the, the leaders of our community were buried there in Ahmedabad. And then from Ahmedabad, they moved to Surat, uh, again, uh, another Gujarati city. And uh, there again, uh, quite a few years passed by, and then they moved to Jamnagar. <laughs> and then from Jamnagar, they decided to move to Mumbai. So it's, got, it's followed from Gujarat to, to Mumbai. So when present HQ is Mumbai, where our leader said, Ma'am, for the Sefuddin, uh, precise all our activities, he is more or less in control. In fact, he has the following of nearly a million Daudi Boras and who actually seek his guidance on a daily basis in every aspect of life, uh, who actually teaches him the guidance of the Holy Quran. Uh, so that's the, the Bori following. And he has established so many, uh, we mentioned about the mosques and how it's supposed to, well, it does actually help the community get together uh, in the mosque and then all we discuss is nothing to do with Islam but we discuss how the business was done mm -hmm. can you <laughs> help me with <laughs> this particular project or the business or where can I can I import this from China or, or Russia to sell here and so rather than discussing anything about Islam they discuss the business element and how they're going to prosper or about schools the children's school and so on that's the idea of getting together on Friday especially the Friday prayers and also recently what Sayedna has done is established central kitchens throughout um, the cities. For example, in Leicester, we have a central kitchen where the food is cooked by women on a voluntary basis. And then it's distributed to all the families, irrespective of whether they contribute to us their food or not, they, they get a free meal in the evenings. Uh, so it's, 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 it's uh, again to create harmonization uh, to work together, you know, to look at other aspects of life uh, and uh, we do be, be together as a one community. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's come back to your uh, story, your uh, first experience in Britain. Britain, yes. Um, yes. You, you were talking about Spence in the Air Force, so yes, let's yes. start from there. Okay, <coughs> fine. <laughs> you know, after the debacle about, you know, having gone through uh, seeing all the roadblocks, uh, we were lucky by this army colonel who helped my father. Uh, we were eventually on the Caledonian Airways who brought us to Stansted Airport. And we were coming down and then my father was called and he said, have I ever got the malaria? <laughs> because we were shivering coming down. Uh, but. We came down and we were, in fact, very warmly welcomed by the NGOs. We could not believe the, uh, the, the feelings you know, they gave us. You know, they held our hands and they brought, brought us down the plane and took us to a center where they had gathered all the warm clothing. And you can tell you about the fear which we had before, where our next bill is going to come from, how we're going to deal with the National Front and all the elements of so many hysteria against us in the country where we are not wanted and uh, no other country wanted to help us anyway uh, but in our family I must also mention that uh, some of my mother's family they settled in Sri Lanka, Colombo and my uncle and I sent a telegram to my father said look please don't go to England come to Sri Lanka and we'll look after you uh, and he's quite a wealthy businessman in fact his sons are still in uh, Colombo and uh, my father said no no we, we don't want to <laughs> because we're British less everybody's going to Britain so let's uh, go to Britain anyway we came down and we were taken to a centre where we were given warm clothing which is first week in November and we were the last ones to leave <laughs> the Uganda and uh, we were taken by a bus to uh, Linfield camp which is in Surrey so Linfield camp yes, sorry. and you know the, the fear which because when we were there, we were surrounded by all these army trucks, all green, 
huge trucks and Land Rovers and trucks and so on. The old army men, you know, with their guns on, and semi-automatic, automatic guns in their hands and so on. Suddenly we, we suddenly we, we come here and we were told that we are going to move army barracks. That <laughs> shook us as well. I <laughs> said, what's going on? We just left an army regime in Uganda. Now, what's all this about? So they took us to a disused um, army barracks in Linfield. And, uh, you know, they, they had this huge uh, halls where, you know, there were so many beds you know, laid out for very clean, neat and tidy. But we had to sleep in, in a huge room uh, full of beds. Uh, uh, and there was just one or two toilets um, in, in, the corridor after, in, in the corridor there. So we, we, we became used to that and we, as I said, NGOs treated us very well. Uh, we started having good breakfast, you know, with cornflakes and Vitavix and whatever we <laughs> were given. And uh, <coughs> the problem after that was, you know, the food, because, you know, we were, especially my parents, were used to the, <laughs> the Western food, especially the English food, which actually didn't taste anything. So, you know, boiled potatoes and uh, vegetables and plus, you know, we uh, could not eat meat because it, it wasn't halal uh, because of the Islamic practice. So we, um, whatever we could eat, you know, we ate and we just said, thank you, you know, whatever you got and so on. <clears throat> and even, you know, the NGOs that looked after our beds, they used to make our beds themselves rather than training us to because we were not used to making beds because we had servants at home. But eventually we started learning all that, you know, how to make a bed, uh, having a proper breakfast and so on. But in Linfield camp, we only lasted about seven days or so. And then we were taken to a camp in Wales. It was called Watch It. Watch It. That was the name of the town. There's another disused army barrack. So we, <coughs> we stayed there for about three or four weeks and uh, got used to eating English food and so on. And uh, in fact, I must also mention some of the incidents which uh, actually make my talk a bit lighter. Uh, see, my brother and I saw, you know, when we were in the coach on our way to Linfield camp, you know, he saw this white man sweeping the road. And he said, Jaffa, you know, there's a white man sweeping the road. How can this possibly be? Because in our brains, you know, it was ingrained to us that the white man would not do a menial job. <laughs> so that was uh, some of the things, you know, which we could remember. And the, uh, we also saw that the, all the shops were closed and the doors were closed. Because in Africa, all the doors remain open because of the climate. Such a warm climate and you don't need to close the door in here because of the winter. This was November. So all the doors were closed, and so we, we found that funny as well. So anyway, we landed up in Wales, and then <coughs> uh, through our network in uh, Leicester, uh, we thought we will settle in Leicester. The, the, the reason is there was already a community there from Kenya, a Gujarati-speaking community. And um, because my father and mother spoke very little English, we thought, at least they'll be able to communicate or deal with the Gujarati is already there, plus the food element, you know, the, the, the Gujarati food. Also, by the time we also picked up the African food as well. But, you know, we would be happy having good food and so on. You know. But we were told that, look, that you cannot go to Leicester, because Leicester City Council had put a full page advertisement in Uganda Argus saying, please don't come here. Don't come to Leicester because everything is full. You won't get a uh, place in schools. You won't. The social services are are not geared to taking any more people to help you. And uh, please don't come to Leicester. There's a full page edit has been there. So we were scared about that as well. But my father said, and we said, look. It doesn't matter, okay, if they don't want us to come to Leicester, I think we should do that. We should go and see w what the Leicester is all about. It's like a child, you know, as a child, not to touch the, the hot iron bar. You would still want to touch it, to feel, you know, what it looks like, or how it feels like. So anyway, he said, no, no, we'll, we'll, we'll go to Leicester. But through a network in Leicester, through friends, uh, we were able to allocate a house uh, which we could rent in a place, in an area called Thurmiston. 
So we requested the, uh, the administration there to see if you could move to less. They said, no, you can't. What we'll do is, first of all, we'll examine what you've got there, and then we'll allow you to go. So they examined this house in Thermaston area of Leicester, North Leicester. Uh, and then it's okay, fine, you can go, and they gave us the train tickets and so on. So we traveled to Leicester. And then while we were traveling in the train, you know, my brother was asking me, so what are these terraced homes? You know, I mean, you know, rows and rows of terraced homes. I said, yes, people live there. I said, what? People live in those houses? Said, yeah. And, uh, but, you know, there's no, I can't see any gardens there or, it's just so compact and he said, yeah, people live there and also the toilets are outside of those homes, you know, so people uh, use the toilet outside, plus they haven't got a bathroom inside the home. They go, they use the, the public uh, bathrooms you know, for, for the showers or, um, I said, okay, fine. So you just, so we couldn't believe all this because in our, in our minds it was ingrained that Britain was a land of milk and honey and, you know, all the buildings would be probably in gold or gold, gold <laughs> plated uh, and you know very wide roads and uh, so it is all sort of built in as that uh, and we never imagined or expected uh, a coal country and also rows and rows of terraced homes but anyway it was an experience and then you know we came to a station called Gloucester and, and the way we pronounce is Gloucester <laughs> because we, we, and there's some funny aspect as well. When we eventually came to Leicester and then entered this home in um, a Bayside Drive in Thermaston. And um, we had coal fire central heating there, and which, we, which we had never used that, so we started learning that. And as mentioned to you earlier, we were seven of us. Uh, and, uh, it's five brothers, two sisters, mother, father, and nine. We lived in just one little home with three bedrooms. And there was a queue for a bathroom. There's only one bathroom. So we had to queue uh, for the bathroom <laughs> early in the morning. So, but we went to, we accepted what, what uh, Allah has given us. And we we're thankful to the British people for, for what they have given us. But our first experience was with our neighbor because we started, my mother started cooking uh, the curry because we were missing all that. So so the neighbors came down and said, look, you cannot, you know, this curry smells, you know, and I, I, I got asthma, you must not cook this in this house, our neighbor. So my mother said, look, you know, we, uh, you know, this is our, our staple diet, you know, we, we eat curry more or less every day. And uh, yeah, it's, it's made of, you know, the, we use onions and garlic and so on, but if you can close all your doors and I'll make sure that my, my kitchen doors, I'll set my kitchen windows and everything is closed, so you get minimum smell from from the, from the cooking. And she was very, very angry with that. She wasn't happy at all. She would not talk to us for quite a few years because, you know, we used to cook curry uh, in our home. So those are the experiences. But the other experience my father had, you know, we were, you know, we were given pocket money in our camp and my father, you know, refused to accept that. He said, look, God has given me hands and feet, why should I be accepting handouts? But, you know, he had no choice because uh, what did he do? He spoke very little English and he had to have some money to, to feed himself and the family as well, but it was very little anyway. But um, he started looking for, my father started looking for a job and obviously nobody would employ him. Uh, simply because he didn't have the linguistic skills. But my elder brother, uh, Anwar, he he got a job with Wilkinson Hardware Store because of his, uh, because he used to work in my father's shop. And in fact, my father had a rule that in Masindi that uh, my brother and I, we had to spend at least one hour in the, in the late afternoon uh, in the shop to learn the, the trading. Uh, so that was compulsory, you know, I mean, if, if, if he, I didn't do that in the evening, you know, we'd have some red eyes, you know, staring at us and say, look, you, you didn't come <laughs> to, to the shop today. And then at, at five o'clock, you know, just finish and then we'd go home and then uh, our servants would prepare our shoes, you know, to go and play either football or whatever. What, what, uh, so that was, so my, my brother had learned the, the selling of 
hardware skills and obviously he, he spoke English as well because we went to the Amasini public school and so in fact he, he got his first job at Wilkinson Hardware uh, within a matter of days uh, and uh, my father said look you better continue with your accountancy studies and if need be you know we'll, we'll, we'll help you so I, I went to Sheffield uh, Polytechnic where I finished where I did my accountancy and then went into employment um, our first experience was very bad in terms of you know my father would not get a job so eventually you know one of the Indian butchers you know he said we used to buy meat for me he said look why don't you come and work for me and my father okay fine he said look I'm looking for a job I, 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 I can't sit at home so he, my father one day came home and said look I've got a job. He said, where? He said, the butchers. I said, no, I'm sorry, we'll not allow you to work in the butchers. You know, you, you, know, you have such a good lifestyle back at home. You're a businessman, a very successful businessman, and we, we don't want you to work as a butcher. Um, obviously, he, he, I mean, he drove there back, back in Uganda. He could not drive here because he had to have a license. So that was another handicap as well. So anyway, uh, he said, okay, fine. And he said, no, no, please let me work in the butchers. And I'll, I'll be there just for a few hours and maybe, you no, know, there's no way we'll allow you to uh, work in the butcher's shop. Uh, but eventually he agreed. He said, okay, fine. But he said, yeah, you, then you must find me a job because I, I don't want to rely on this handout, you know, which we get from the government. And I must be such, I've got my feet are working, my hands are working. So why can't I get a job? <laughs> so you know, he wanted to be employed by, uh, to make sure that you know, he's not dependent on the state. But that was not going to happen. So eventually, you know, between the, the five brothers, my younger, younger brothers went to schools, so, uh, so local schools around in uh, Thermiston uh, and uh, started the education. But between the brothers, we said, okay, fine, let's try and see if my father could be employed by having a little shop somewhere where we could rent it out and open up a small shop. He is occupied. And after four or five years, that's what we did. We opened up a small shop on Melton Road. And um, did, we call it mini supermarket, and it was a very small supermarket. And uh, um, he started working there and in the English he started to learn as well because you know, he also my, my mother started learning English as well and we, we had this lady she an English lady she used to come home who teach us English and uh, the, the business wasn't doing well after a couple of years we decided to sell but it wasn't doing well at all the profitability was very low plus the hard work you know uh, <laughs> opening the, the shops all the time and so on, you know, be Lukawalas as well, you know, in that way. <laughs> Plus, you know, we open the shops all the time, even if it's Saturday or Sunday, you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> as long as we get customers, we'll open it. And you can see that how the whole country has changed. Because when we came here, I think you can remember, on Saturday afternoon, everything was closed. Sunday, everything was closed. And so we changed the culture of the shops. But the shops are open all hours, you know, and a uh, friendly smile, good service is given, uh, and a good backup. And we, we changed the whole shopping culture in this country, and, and that's how we started, the Ugandans started uh, doing that while uh, we came here. My brother, he progressed to become a manager of Wilkin, one of the Wilkinson Hardware stores, and they considered him very loyal uh, to, to Wilkinson's. But you see this, I mentioned to you earlier, because we come from the Dukawala so thinking, uh, he wasn't able to work under, uh, uh, as a manager either. We even had a way, uh, about 14, 15 staff in a large Wilkinson store in Odd B and so on. So he eventually started his own on the, uh, hardware business. He still has got now. <laughs> and my younger brother also, he, my youngest brother, uh, the, the fifth one, he did the same, he's got a shop in Nottingham now. Uh, because somehow, you know, we weren't able to work or adjust our thinking to working as an employee. Uh, because the mind thinks independently. And it's, if somebody places an order, or say, do this and don't do this, and so look, 
oh, why is this telling me? You know, with my own mind, I can, <laughs> I can think, and I know what to do, and I know what's the best to do. So why is it? So that culture is ingrained in the, particularly the Gujarati community, where you know we'll not be able to work under, under someone. And uh, some of my friends and. Uh, they, 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 never seen, they, they started working for a company called Imperial Tribe Writers, which is an American company called Lit Litton Industries. And they started assembling those tribe writers because they had no choice but to get a job. Some of them started working in the British United Shoe Machinery Company. It was quite large in those days. You know, they, they had such a vast business expire, BUSM, British United Shoe Machinery Company. A lot of started, the women particularly, because they also wanted to do some work, you know, they wanted to uh, help the family, you know, come up and uh, and make sure that children receive private education if possible, best education and so on. So they started working for the garment and knitting industry. Uh, there were a lot of garment factories there. In fact, when we came in the 60s, sorry, 70s, the garment industry was totally in a decline. Uh, in Leicester, Leicester used to produce good quality garments. Garments. I mean, a company called Byfords, uh, Courtauld's. You know, they used to manufacture quality garments. But the sales were falling; they could not compete. Uh, so what we did as Ugandan nations, we started because we had never seen a knitting machine back in in Uganda. So we said, look, uh, that's how the fabric is manufactured. So there's knitting machines which goes around the circle. It's got this needles in and junkers and so on. So let's let's start working on those. So they bought they bought these obsolete machines, you know, from uh, some of the old knitting plants, and they brought it there in the garages or in their homes wherever, and they started learning about the knitting industry, and the, the, how the clothes are knitted. Uh, and then eventually, you know, there are so many factories run by particularly the Gujarati community, and also there's some Punjabi from the Sikh community and the Punjabi community, they also were in the knitting trade, the knitting industry trade there. You know, they started uh, manufacturing fabric and clothing, and, and from fabric and so on, they produced the garments. Uh, so that's that's how, uh, and the good thing was that this, there's so many women unemployed, uh, particularly from Uganda. So. They started working in this fact and revived the whole industry, the knitting industry in Leicester, uh, the knitwear, the knitting, the, the garment, was revived by us, the Uganda nations, uh, from say 1970s till about 1990s. And it's estimated that around 60,000 people were employed by these Gujaratis from, uh, uh, mainly from Uganda. The Gujaratis from Kenya and Tanzania as well. But it was mainly the the, the, in, the Gujaratis from um, uh, Uganda who revived the whole economy of uh, Leicester. One example I can give you is the company called LPC, the Leicester Pepper Company. Uh, it was owned by a Ugandan family, the Ismaili family, and uh, they, in the highest as a higher time, they employed a thousand people in just as one family. Uh, in fact, that that plant was sold about three years ago to an Italian company. Um, so th there are so many other examples, you know, I mean, um, in a company called Boston Dyers and uh, there's so many. In fact, even in, in, in Leicester today, you find that the Gujaratis from Malawi are doing extremely well as well. In fact, uh, uh, you know, the, the pound shop. Pound stretcher, I think so. He, yeah, he's bought by a, a Gujarati Muslim from uh, Malawi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but find in 50 shops, pound stretcher or pound shop, one or the other, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. And because they're in a cash and carry called Crown Crest. Yeah, pound stretcher, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, so they, all, all Gujarat is coming good. So, so I think um, with this journey, you changed the landscape of Leicester, but also with that, they also brought a lot of cultural influence because in Leicester now you see lots of temples and mosques mus and yes, yes. also how, how have the Gujaratis influenced the cultural fabric of Leicester? Yeah, I think they've done extremely well. For example, the 
the, the Navrati Diwali festival attracts around between 50 to 60,000 people who come on the Diwali festival uh, to Belgrade Road. And these are people who come from Norway, Sweden, Scotland, Wales, you know, to see the whole uh, scenario at the Navratri festival and also the lighting of the Diwali lights. You see, we, the city council actually organizes this uh, where Diwali lights are lit by either the Lord Mayor and the dignitaries who come in. Uh, in fact, in one of the last functions we had the manager of the Leicester City Football Club who came in uh, to, 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 be, to celebrate uh, this festival. And um, it's a huge festival, I think probably the largest outside India. So not only does it, it's a cultural and traditional uh, Navratri festival followed by Diwali celebration of uh, good over evil, but um, it brings in a lot of people, it brings a lot of um, people from different communities coming to celebrate it. And uh, it's such a harmonious atmosphere you see in Leicester. Uh, and uh, such a joyful, harmonious, uh, all people of all cl class, creed, they come together and celebrate Diwali. And uh, probably in terms of lighting, you know, you see all the Diwali lights and it's totally lit. The whole road from Belgian Road to Melton Road is lit with beautiful lighting. Uh, and um, sort of portraying the religion uh, in, in a very class, very classy fashion as well. I mean, we've got temples, we've got Swaminara and Temple there. It's, again, it's a huge temple there, very well built. And there's a Sanatan Mandir, uh, which is on, on Catherine Street, which is very well managed and run by this particular group. There's Ram Mandir, which is uh, uh, managed by the, the, the Lohana community. Again, they not only worship, they also hold other events, for example, the Gujarati, I think there's one program which is coming up in the next few weeks, is the Gujarati play or drama, which is coming to Ram and David in, 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 the, in the, the Lohana community, but it's open to all, the you pay about five, ten pounds for the tickets and enjoy the show in Gujarati. And there are all the other the, the, to try, you see, the community is trying to make sure that the youngsters get involved and also participate in some of these events, particularly in Navaratri and so on, so that the religion is uh, remain intact. But it's, it's a difficult journey, but we're getting there. The, but it's, it's brought a lot of good... If, if you look at it from a business point of view, if you talk to the jewelers on, on Melton Road, Belgian Road, they say, look, Diwali time is our best time, we make a lot of money. And also the wedding season is, is, is just started now. And uh, the jewelers make a lot of money. Uh, the sari trade is active, even though sari, wearing the sari is in a decline overall. The exes don't want to wear it. But still, you know, they, they, whenever the festivals are there, they participate. Amongst the Muslim community, again, it, it is also brought in a lot of, a lot of mosques are there, I believe, around uh, or 30 mosques now with different groups uh, saying their prayers. But we've got Turkish Muslims there, so they want to, because of linguistic difficulties, they will not join our mosque because uh, of the, uh, the language. And there are a lot of the Lebanese mosques, and then there is Somali mosques, and then the, the Gujaratis, uh, they've got their own mosque there, where the majority of the worshippers are Gujaratis because of the linguistic um, uh, language is so common to, to them so they, they get together in mosques and there are Pakistani mosques as well and because they speak mainly Urdu so they uh, have their, their own separate mosques as well because again they are, they've got their own culture tradition so they so, but uh, they're also uh, Christian uh, Gujaratis as well they, they go to worship in, in a church but they speak Gujarati uh, in the church as well so <laughs> you can see how Gujaratis are prospered not only in wealth but in all, all other aspects as well. And if you go to, if you remember, in housing, what we've done, I've been a chairman of Azra Housing Association, which uh, one of the leading members we established in 1986 to cater for Gujarati, in fact, Asian elderly rather than Gujarati. And then we cater for the food, for example, the strict vegetarians as well. And there are 
a few who would want to eat halal food as well. So we had the, the, we had a scheme in Holden Street where we'd cook strict vegetarian meals, cooked by uh, the people from that particular group of people who would actually come and provide you know, vegetarian meals and there would be some uh, non-vegetarian meals as well. And we would cater for the food aspect and we, in fact we used to do meals on wheels for people who are at home and they want to uh, eat a strict vegetarian meal. So we would provide that. And we had a contract with city council uh, that even though Azra did the housing, but it also provided meals as well. And we had that contract for, for about three years. And we used to cook around 80,000 meals, I think a year, I think, yeah. So there's a lot of demand there. So what has the Leicester City Council got to say now after? <laughs> Just reminding the the, the, the the slogan "Don't come to Oh Leicester. yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> in fact, uh, we see when we marked the forty years of existence in Leicester, the the leader of the council did apologize again and said, "Look, we're sorry that uh, this happened uh, in the nineteen seventy two, and in fact." Uh, it is these evaluations who have actually changed the face of Leicester. And in particular, in fact, in fact, leader also mentioned that this Melton Road Belgrade was earmarked for demolition. Yes, they had earmarked for demolition. Now, if you go to, I mean, that's called, they've been named it Golden Mile. It's because of the jewelry shops, the glittering sari shops, uh, and wonderful restaurants, strictly, some of them strictly vegetarian restaurants. I think probably, I think that's the only place where you get you know, good vegetarian meal as well. And it's because many of them come from Uganda, they also provide you with uh, cassava, we call it mogo, uh, in some of the items that they, 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 they give. And then, uh, you know, we also follow the bell puris and <laughs> all the others as well. And it, it's quite a popular area if you want to eat uh, some vegetarian meal in the, the Belga Road, Melton Road area. It's probably one of the best, uh, maybe in, in the country. It's in a small area, you'd find all these restaurants, and people who want to even do do shopping for weddings, they come to this particular area and do their shopping in just in one small area. And, and the city council has recognized that, even though, as as a business community, I've been involved in in the association business association, we have been lobbying for parking facility because there is no proper parking in the area. Uh, and people have been complaining that we would like to come uh, to Belgrave Road, Melton Road, but you know we can't find parking. Plus, the people, quite a few people in wheelchair as well, so we really need proper access for them to enjoy, you know, shopping and going to restaurants, shopping, and, and you know, and enjoy that area. But I think city council is trying to work with us in that respect. But I think they, their thinking is totally changed now. They they think that these guys are are, are really. Uh, wheelers and dealers and we want them and they've contributed and we appreciate w what they've done particularly in employment as well you know because there are lots of people are uh, employed by our own p businesses uh, and obviously that's, that's had the local economy uh, the youngsters are in the professions more but even then you know solicitors practices accountants practices and so many others you know they're extremely well in, in Leicestershire you have a, an accountancy firm. Yes, yes, I do. I do. Yes, yeah. I think um, Lester asked you to stay back, but then Uganda called you back as well. Let's talk about that. Um. Sure. <laughs> yes, yeah. I think, um, see, when we had the first visit of President Museveni to Leicester, uh, he invited us and, and he invited the Lord Mayor, who's actually Mrs. the former Lord Mayor, Manjula Bensu. And um, we went to, four of us, we went to meet him at the Marriott Hotel in, um, uh, in Leicester. And you know, his theme was, uh, please come back. You, know, you, you guys have left Uganda and uh, Uganda needs you to, uh, for prosperity and for uh, making sure that uh, everybody benefits in terms of employment in, in, in Africa and so on, in Uganda particularly. So, in fact, we had a we had a big gathering at the Aga, Aga Khan Center in, in, in Hamilton in Leicester, where the president actually uh, invited all of us back and said, we will 
uh, protect your investments. If you do decide to invest, will through the uh, United Nations Agency, IMF, and the World Bank will protect your investment as well. Because a lot of questions were raised. Look, if you come there, you know what happens to our investment. Uh, and um, I mean, he is able to answer everything very articulately. You know, he and he meant business because he's very, he seems to be very business. Even he comes from I mean background, but he's very business minded. Whereas he's looking for his community to actually benefit from what the Gujarati or the the, the 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 Indian community has to offer in terms of business and all the other skills. So, and this is he followed by um, one day. You know, he came to. But two years back, he came to London, uh, and then he invited us to meet him uh, again to promote trade between uh, Leicester and, and Uganda. And then he suddenly made an announcement that I would like uh, Jaffa Kapasi to be my uh, ambassador in the Midlands. Uh, and I, to be honest, I didn't know; I wasn't expecting it. And suddenly, you know, we I had to go through the motion of, well, look, okay, fine. And he said, look, your role will be to uh, promote trade and please bring people in uh, uh, Uganda to, 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 to trade, uh, invest in anything from schools to uh, um, in, in, in the hotel or catering industry to uh, manufacturing. You know, so please invite people in uh, to, to Uganda. We'll make sure that they get all the facilities as well. So it, for me, it's, it's, it's a full circle because you know, one day we were deported. Now you suddenly you become an ambassador of the, the same country to promote trade. But I think he means well and he's done a lot for the country. Because when I went in 1992 with the Sun newspaper, we stayed at Sheraton, which, which was, if you remember, Apollo Hotel, the best hotel in, in maybe in Uganda in those days. And you know, you won't believe me, but it's true that you know, for breakfast, we got matoke, right? This, the green, the green bananas, <clears throat> and for lunch, we got matoke and some tomatoes, <laughs> and, and in dinner, we got the same thing again. Uh, that was in a five star hotel, there was nothing else because there was nothing else. And uh, when we went to see the the Kampala Road, you know, which is a thriving business area when we were there, it's just like Oxford Street of England. Uh, there's nothing in the shops, the shops, there's nothing there to, to sell or buy. And so, so this is what Uganda was only in 1992. Uh, but it, the good thing was it was safe, it was very safe. You could go out in the evenings and you know, you, you won't be harmed, you won't hear the machine gun fires and so on, which people used to talk about. And uh, when we left, about 100 Indians were left behind, those who were maybe on their own or they didn't have the family, about 100 of them. And some of them had come from other towns, you know, Lira and, and so on. So they were living in a temple. I think they were living in, I think some of them were in temple. No, sorry. Uh, one of the Hindu temples, they were living, all of them were together. So they... <coughs> I think we've survived and you know we've been through all the hard times and yes we will we start up businesses as we go along and some of them have done they're very successful business people now so it, it, it was really I mean between 1992 when I went there first when I went to, to my school uh, in, in this Masini public school there's no doors left behind no the, the windows and there's some pictures here as you can see there's nothing there uh, and uh, the oh, you know, some of our Gujarati teachers who came from India when I was a student there, so they built massive big gardens. You know, they enjoyed planting very good um, uh, sort of uh, flowering trees and all, and even shrubs and so on. Nothing was left behind. And so I met the headmaster in the school when I went to, and I said, "Look, uh, can I can I have a you know what happened to the garden, beautiful garden, and so on?" And he said. And there was this there was this album which was uh, there, and I said, look, look, can you see? And in fact, I've got pictures with the headmaster there. Uh, I've shown him the garden which existed when we were there, and there's nothing left behind. Okay, I can't see any windows and doors in the school, but at least you left maintained the garden, you know. But 
nobody had done that either. So the country actually, what I'm trying to say, it needed a lot of investment, a lot of infrastructure, roads, uh, transport, hospitals, and so on, which more or less non-existent. So President Museveni was right in inviting us back there. So that he knew that this, this, this particular community will actually input so much to the country. So when I went uh, on a trade mission followed by that, I was interviewed by Uganda Television. And the first question that the reporter asked me was, or this journalist asked me was, have you come to exploit us again? So my answer was, look, I think if you study carefully that we have come here to actually improve, invest, and also to get back to get back to Uganda the way it was before when we left. And again, he said, you feel that we have been exploiting you. Yes, some of us, yes, I agree. Uh, just a f small minority, yes, we, we have a exploit, which I accept. But if you look at the 20 year history of Ugandan Asians in England, there are about 100 Patels who have become millionaires. Now, are you going to tell me that they have become millionaires by exploiting the British? And so he shut down actually. I said, look, in their way, when I, when I went back in 1900, there were about 100 or so Patel families that had really prospered in this country. But also, you've got to remember that this country has offered us, you know, uh, it is a land of opportunity. I mean, it's, it's you know, if, if you have the skills, knowledge, and, and the stamina to progress, um, this country is ideal compared to others. Okay, we have obstacles, we have got red tape, we have got bureaucracy to deal with, but it's still, I think it's, it's offered us quite a lot of things which doesn't exist in other countries. Uh, so, I mean, in that way, I think we are very thankful to the British people. But again, when I went to, back, go back to when I went to Uganda the uh, second time, you know, the, the immigration officer would not stamp my passport with an exit stamp. He said, look, you've got to stay here. This is your country. You can't go back to England. He refused to stamp my passport for, for an exit visa. So you see, the, the Africans had also suffered. When, when, when I went to uh, a market in Jinja, Again, it was a small manufacturing town of Uganda. I went to the market and you know, people cried and just started hugging me, said, welcome back, please come back, uh, talk to us, and please bring your family back. And I said, why? Because you deported us. You know, I remember it's only 22 years ago, you, know, that you, you just got rid of us from this country. And we have suffered, our parents have suffered because they built Uganda and you, you destroyed the country, and you also destroyed us in that process. If you ask our feelings, that we, we, we have been deported, you know, and you deport a person when you, 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 you find that this person is not suitable for this country, or, or is doing something wrong with the country, so that's why we deported. So you deported now, you said, come back. You said, look, Kapasi, uh, you know, we have actually had the Matoke in this country without any salt. We didn't have any salt in the country during Amin's time. So you can see the hardship which we have faced. Plus, look at the killing which went on. Anyone who says anything or opposes uh, Idi Amin gets killed. No, so that's what, you know, so please do come back. We want you. You are the Wana Inchi, you know, the African word, Wana Inchi, because you are local. You, you are the local African. And you must come back. Uh, and develop this country. This is coming from somebody who has come to shop in, in, in the market, you know, asking us, welcoming back, come back, come back, you know. Did some uh, people go back? A, a few did, yes, yeah. I think, especially, you know, the first people who went back were the Madhwanis, you know, who actually ruled the trade, you know, and then the, the Metas and the... Excuse yeah. me, Nina. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Because, yes. you see, they developed everything so fast. Plus, you see, they were lucky. They were able to get help from IM, uh, sorry, the World Bank. Uh, they financed the projects and they revived the economy of Uganda. They started employing people. So that's uh, quite, quite a few have gone gone back. And also, some are here and they're still trading with Uganda. For example, 
a friend of mine from Leicester, he, he did a solar energy project about, about 10 million investment only uh, last month. Uh, so they met Museveni and um, so they're people with new ideas. In fact, some of the Ugandans, second, third generation are going to trade. Um, a friend of mine, he is um, uh, from Kampala. His son actually has established a school in um, Kampala, uh, in a private school. So it, it's, uh, he's, he said, I'm doing quite well now. Uh, and uh, in fact, um, the Aga Khan has, in fact, has increased his investment so much we can't believe it because he's not only built schools or running the schools, uh, in fact, he's building the largest hospital in Kampala. Because if you go to Mulaga Hospital, if you remember, uh, there are no, not enough beds and, and you find the patients on the floor. Even today, this uh, Mulaga Hospital was given to the Ugandan government as a gift by the British government. Uh, when, when the, because the, the British built a, a high class, huge Mulaga Hospital. And it's really declined, you know, you got no proper facilities, not even medicine. You, you can't get it in Mulaga Hospital. So Aga Khan is building the second, so in fact the largest hospital in Kampala. And he was struggling to get it approved for planning law. So he, he approached the, the president. In fact, the Aga Khan's ambassador asked me to thank Museveni. I met him, President Museveni, in September as Consul General, and uh, he conveyed the message, please thank President Museveni for allowing all the door to, to allow all the doors to open for him to, to build uh, this hospital. But his other investment is in the infrastructure in terms of he's built uh, the second largest dam with the dam with the help of the Chinese uh, near um, in next to the Owen Falls, the Aga Khan is dam. But there are so many other, I mean, from India, Tatas have gone back. Uh, that they are involved in so many different businesses. There are other Indian companies as well in telecommunications who have actually expanding in Uganda, uh, and, and so many other, I mean, so many other aspects as well. I mean, they've got sugarcane estates. Some of the Indian companies have got sugarcane estates, uh, and um, in terms of manufacturing, I think they need to really introduce that to Africa now, you know, because manufacturing is very little. Uh, in, in Uganda, in the other East African countries as well. Because in the motor trade, you know, they, they, were, they were to assemble some of these cars and trucks. And, 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 but, but Rwanda is doing well, and Rwanda, with the help of Ugandans, so on, their economy there. And in fact, they are, the East African economy now is that they are, they are doing the opposite of Brexit now. They will soon have just one currency between all these East African countries. And uh, they'll open up all the doors in terms of trading. All the bureaucracy will be gone. And if you obtain a visa for, say, Uganda, then you can travel to Kenya, Tanzania, I think Zambia, uh, and uh, Rwanda. So things will really open up, uh, and hopefully it will um, prosper the, the region, which it, and also it desperately needs investment. Uh, if you look at tourism, uh, because I still remember, you know, when, <laughs> when I was living in Butiaba, you know, we... We had this veranda, and, you know, and then there was, because we were living on the coast, so there was a sand there. And in the evening, you know, the hippos would come and throw water at each other. And I, used to, I remember seeing those hippos from, from the veranda of my <laughs> garden, you know. So, it's, 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 it's you know, this scenario you, you never imagine, but uh, you know, that's, that's the lifestyle we had, and surrounded by all the wonderful animals, you know, uh, giraffes, I mean, if you, go out of Masindi about 10 miles, you start seeing giraffes, you know, eating from the trees and uh, then you go across and then you'll, you'll see all the others, you know, zebras and hundreds of them and so on. So it's got such a natural wildlife. Plus the climate is brilliant, you know. Uganda doesn't need air, air conditioning system. It doesn't need the heating system. Uh, it's just natural. The sunrise, sunset is about the same time because it's, uh, Uganda is on equator, and um, the you know you, not only you would enjoy the climate, the food is so. I mean, you, you remember tasting all the, veg the vegetables and all the fruit. It is organic. You know, it's, it's touch the sun, and you know it's so. Uh, 
wonderful. You know, it, it's so tasty to eat uh, Ugandan grown food and also the quinoa, also the milk tastes so good. And once you've eaten those fruits and vegetables and so on in Uganda, you don't want to eat anything in this country <laughs> because it is not organic, you know. So that, that's, you know, these are the differences which you miss. Uh, so there's a lot of, it's a land of opportunity again, Uganda, and I'm sure that people, others would also go and invest. Um, because, you know, I mean, uh, we talk to people here in this country about investment in uh, amongst the mainstream, and there's a look, I find there's an HIV there. Yes, Uganda has been too worse for HIV to, to, to addressing those. Uh, but, you know, you have to address it and uh, we'll get the right answers and we'll get the right results. And uh, people talk about malaria because there's a new form of malaria now. <laughs> so what we had in our days. But again, you know, people will conquer that as well. You know, uh, People are resilient, you know, they, they'll conquer that. Do you call Britain your home now? Okay, <laughs> it's a very difficult question to answer because <clears throat> even though I lived here m many more years than I lived in Uganda, you know, my, my affinity is still where I was born in, in a small village called Masinde. So I have that affinity to Uganda which will always remain. Plus, it's been strengthened by my appointment as Consul General of Uganda to the Midlands. Uh, but I mean, Britain, I would say, um, even though Britain has given me a lot, uh, education, you know, the housing and all that, and, and, and also the opportunity to uh, make some money as well in this country. But so in that way, I'm grateful to, to the British people and, and, and the United Kingdom. But my Indian origin also, an attachment to Gujarat, where I met Mr. Modi twice. Uh, in fact, when I led a trade mission to Gujarat as well in 2004 when I met Mr. Modi for the first time and uh, he in fact he knew he, he addressed me as oh hello Kapasi you come from Leicester uh, I said yes I got a small trade delegation members from Leicester who in fact, one, one of our businessmen in exports some also has to Gujarat uh, Mr. Patel Nainesh Patel <laughs> so and st still in cheese and so on he said yeah okay and I said, Mr. Modi, you know, I've got one suggestion to you. I said, he says, what? He said, look, you know, at the moment, the, the Indian vegetables which we eat, you send it to Mumbai, from Mumbai it comes to Heathrow, from Heathrow it comes to Leicester. That's not on. He says, what do you mean? I said, look, you know, we need, we need to open up, where, you know, a flight from Ahmedabad lands on East Midlands Airport, mm -hmm. which is a cargo airport. So we can have your fruits and vegetables very fresh. Oh, he said, Kapasi, why don't you come and see me in the evening with your delegation? So he's so committed to business. And then I met him again in uh, Wembley Stadium when he was here. Uh, and you know, we invited to have lunch, sorry, dinner with him at Wembley Stadium when he met me. And he said, uh, he, you know, he didn't shake hands with me. He said, um, he touched my right hand. He said, uh, give my salams to Sayyid Nebisha, our leader in because he is, is very close to uh, Sayyidna. He knows about the Bori community as well. So he said, give my salams to Sayyidna. And he had a busy schedule, you know, the British Prime Minister, David Cameron was with him. And um, I, you know, he's surrounded by nearly 60,000, mainly, mainly Gujaratis. <laughs> and he's there, yes. <laughs> and uh, um, was, uh, we, we were in, in the top floor, you know, with the, we had uh, lunch together and, and then dinner when he, when he came in and I believe some photographs were taken per group and so on, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very committed to business, yeah, He's being a Gujarati as well, Mr. Modi. <laughs> sure. Just one last question. What has this journey taught you from Gujarat to Africa to Britain? I think it's taught me a lot because you see we we have crossed three continents the indian continent uh, subcontinent uh, africa and um, britain now and um, it's it's made me very strong in in my thinking and also my uh, liaison with other people of other communities other groups where i think everybody has one people even though 
you know, he, he may be British or you know, of, of Indian origin or maybe is, is British of Irish origin and, and so on. So, you know, you start thinking globally rather than in a narrow field uh, of your own group. So, and uh, the and, and, and the best way to, what I've learned is that, is to trade, you know, we um, build bridges across the bridges and, and live as one people. Uh, and you can see all the strife there is in the world at the moment and there's no need for that. If, if you just think ahead, so look, we are all creation, one creation, uh, one people, you know, one country. Why do we have to do all this, you know, fight, uh, create um, hell for women and children in the countries where suffering is going on? Uh, so it's made me strong that way. And obviously, I'm a very small minority who would probably able to not able to address because I'm not involved in politics. But I would also like to see, our, particularly the Gujarati community from all sectors, whether they're Hindus, Muslim, Christians, to uh, come out and you know come out of the shell and join the political establishment to, to have their voice uh, and, and uh, also we, we, we should have a powerful voice once once we are there. Okay. You have a mission for young people. <laughs> yes, sorry, I think yeah, I missed the young people. I think the young people should really. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that because that is very important. We, we would have failed if you have not trans translated this into young people because young people should have connection with uh, Gujarat and India and obviously Africa is, is a trading opportunity and Britain to contribute to the British society because we live here they are born here uh, they should contribute in so many ways in in education in, in health and in, in the business and all the social the cultural aspect of this country by getting involved in I mean, I'm, I'm proud to see some of them Coming, co coming up in, say, in the media section, you see a lot of Asians coming up, you know, giving news and or newscasters and so on. So, uh, which is a great thing. And even if you look at the medicine, I mean, uh, one of the top heart specialists in Leicester is from Kenya. Uh, uh, so, Samani, Mr. Samani, uh, I think he's probably the. He's been knighted. It was knighted last year. Uh, professors of mine. So, and there are very many others as well. So the youngsters need to follow them and make sure that they also have the input and not sit at home and wait, waiting for the benefit check to arrive. <laughs>